session we will be discussing on innovative ways of attracting top talent while providing effective motivation to retain existing resources exploring innovative strategies and transformation of recruitment norms and also on sharing of global innovative pedagogical practices and a sustainable model for engagement of international faculty members in india and ladies and gentlemen may i invite a uh, distinguished moderator for the session professor n b vergis vice chancellor national institute of educational planning and administration nepa let's put our hands together to welcome him I also have the privilege in inviting our eminent panelists. I invite Dr. G K Prabhu, President Manipal University, Jaipur. Warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Professor Ridesh Deshpande, Vice Chancellor, Ajinkya D Y Patel University. A warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Dr. Sandeep Sancheti, Vice Chancellor, Marwadi University. A very warm welcome, sir. Inviting Professor W. C. Wong, National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And also inviting Dr. Ram K. Sharma, Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Petroleum and Energy Studies. Very warm welcome to you, sir. So ladies and gentlemen once again the topic for this session is developing world class faculty the time duration is 1 hour that is 60 minutes and during this 60 minutes we will have the opening and closing remarks by the distinguished moderator deliberations by all our eminent panelists and if time permits we will have good afternoon to all of you it's indeed a great pleasure for me to be the moderator i should say that I was slated as a speaker. Perhaps the chairperson who, who was supposed to chair the session had other important meeting, so I was upgraded to the uh, to be a moderator. So I was told that I should take my five to six minutes, which will be the time allocated to each of these speakers on this. I think. I think. I think let me start by saying that one of the problems in higher education is how do you maintain quality when i come to the teachers teaching learning process etc at a later stage so when i say that how do you maintain quality the question is that little more appropriately posed is that how do we maintain quality in a massifying system when higher education was a lead system when those enrollment ratios were in single digits we did not face these questions of quality to that extent but when the system is expanding with around 38 million students and 26% as the ger and when the new education policy states that we are going to universalize higher education our simple estimates indicate that that means there will be around 72 to 74 million students in the universities and colleges which is higher than the population of many countries majority of the countries in the world so how do we respond to that added to that is another problem that many of the teaching positions today are lying vacant both in the universities and in the colleges now if you consider the masters level admissions in india you find that it is around 11% only and if the system is going to expand as it is projected we'll have a problem of teacher shortage not only because the appointments are not taking place but also because of the fact that the masters degree level or graduate level education expansion is low because all those who are completing masters do not join higher education system so only a small share that is joining so that creates a problem the third problem that i find when we talk about quality or the best teachers is that the best friend the system do not join teaching profession there is a famous theory of second rates 
actually I am also a professor so I am not saying that I am a second rate but if you calculate if you estimate that I am a second rate I have no problems in accepting that but basically what happens is that the best students coming from the university system after completing their masters go for other areas or domains of employment rather than to teaching so that is one of the reasons it is said that you know it's a second race we have made several efforts to see that there is an improvement that is taking place in terms of the recruitment pattern and it is related to the quality of higher education that you are talking about when UGC implemented in 1989 for the first time this is what we call as the net examination you find that we have analyzed around 4.8 lakhs students or candidates who appeared for the net examination. So what we find is that there is to be part one, part two and part three in, the, in this examination and now it is changed and the part three is the subject specific questions and answers. And what we found was that the highest failure rate was in part three. So I have one question that I am posting that at the entry level, if this is the case, what we can do to develop the mass world class teachers, etc. So there is a deficit. There is a knowledge deficit that you are talking about, you know. So what is also happening is that the content knowledge of teachers lag behind the knowledge developed by the disciplines. I think that is the major crisis that is faced in higher education, especially the disciplinary knowledge grows very fast, but the teacher's capacity to catch up with the changes that are taking place in the terms of the knowledge proliferation is rather limited. So this keeps the teachers far behind. Now the students are far ahead in terms of information, I am not talking in terms of knowledge, but in terms of information. The teachers lag behind both in terms of information and also in terms of the knowledge that you are talking about, you know. So therefore, how do we readjust to that? One thing that we find is that when we go to the best institutions in the country, whether it is in the science discipline or social science disciplines, etc., they have best institutions in the country. I'm talking about NIRF ranking, top ranking institutions. One trend that you find is that they will have a good share of teachers. I will not say majority. Good share of teachers who are trained abroad or who have been having collaborations with abroad or having continuing arrangements of collaborations and co-authorship with uh, higher education institutions abroad. So this is, I feel, is a way of going ahead. Say for example, the 2021 science report of UNESCO indicates that there is a substantial variation in terms of the knowledge production that is taking place between the countries. Among the countries, this variation varies from 4,000 plus scientists per 1 lakh population, whereas in India it is only 217 and in China it is 213. So there is a substantial difference that you find in terms of the our capacity to produce knowledge. Secondly, you also find that it is a collaborative research that is picking up very fast. And that is very important even to improve the rankings, global rankings, I am not talking about the national rankings, even to improve the global rankings, it becomes very necessary because if you take the Nobel laureates between 2000, uh, uh, 1900 and now, there are 1,975 1, Nobel laureates. Some of the Nobel Prizes are shared by more than two or three people. And out of that, 40% goes to United States. Out of the 40% that is going to United States, 30% are the people who are migrated to United States, not the natives. Which tells us a story of the mobility that is taking place for the teachers and the researchers and those who are involved or engaged with the, the knowledge production processes. So therefore, there is a way in which we will be in a position to uh, contribute to the knowledge production and transfer this to the students in a better way. So I feel that uh, there are three or four characteristics I feel if you are talking about knowledge production and also teaching learning process to improve the quality. One is that how do we develop critical thinking among the students. 
critical thinking means we do not go by what others are saying we go by empirical evidence this is an important dimension in the post truth era where we are living that you know we look into the empirical evidence and based on that we continue our discourses the second one is that criticality which is an, an essential analytical capacity that we are talking about whereby we say that we are in a position to place a problem in its theoretical context which needs a deep theoretical understanding a broad understanding of the situation the third dimension i will say that how do we become more democratic or how do we democratize quality how do we democratize the process whereby the teaching learning process is becoming uh, also an important dimension it's not confined to the best students in the class the interaction is not between the best teacher and the best students but it is also leading to many other places because knowledge can be used for two purposes one is substantiate something knowledge can be used the other one is to legitimize something most of the policy makers are more interested to the second part of the decision making process whereby you want to use the knowledge for legitimizing and many of our professors may be happy to actively engage or competing to engage to legitimize a process so that is not the primary function of uh, education knowledge production and knowledge transaction that has to take place and so therefore that is the place where we have to see that where do we stand so for example karl popper once said that uh, in the name of tolerance the right not to tolerate the intolerant is the right way so which means that we should have that capacity a critical capacity not to tolerate the intolerant intolerant idea intolerant person and that is the way we build that i will say that uh, therefore the academic world works through persuasion and argument these are the two important tools and instruments based on which academics function it is not through arrogance and adversaries it is through persuasion and argument so my point is that if you are talking about world class teachers and to improve the quality of higher education and to produce world class students what we need is that how do we develop an argumentative researcher not a passive person but an argumentative researcher that there remains when i talk about the critical criticality and the democratic functioning of the teachers etc is all effort is to see that we develop a tolerant argumentative researcher that should be the role of higher education our teacher should try to emulate try to uh, support that effort by the higher education system friends i am finishing my time let me go to the next role as a moderator we have very eminent speakers here perhaps more eminent not perhaps certainly more eminent than what i am so let us listen to them and they need not have to follow in any of the points or arguments that i made but they have their own independent arguments so it is not a although i made some statements in the initial stages that does not make a framework for the moderation responsibility that i have so may i request uh, rajesh tandon is not here so may i request uh, dr prabhu to take his 5 to 6 minutes please come here good afternoon respected chairperson and uh, other co panelists and all the members over here i have a uh, 10 points which are the in my opinion they are the key characteristics to serve as a success factor in building the world class faculty i will not elaborate on any of these points but just note down these 10 points and maybe during the question and answer if any of these points need to be elaborated i would be very happy point number 1 operational environment this is nothing but which is an very important which becomes uh, first thing it attracts the the quality faculty to come and participate 
of course here also we have some operational uh, environment difficulties let us uh, try to adjust uh, for us the second part is second point is a networks collaboration and alliances this is a very important for the universities when a faculty joins he would enjoy working with the other departments within the institution or partner universities if the university creates an environment for the networking with other partners whether it is an industry or an academic institution within india or outside that is the one key factor to get this faculty at our institution third point is the quality of life which is also very important when we talk about quality of life both academic and personal many times many institutions faculty they keep telling that their more time is they are spending on the the journey reaching the campuses and all if the the campus creates an atmosphere to give that kind of an ecosystem and improves the quality of life it is the interesting for uh, the universities to retain or to attract the good faculty fourth one is an interdisciplinary research and approach so let us say if we appoint some faculty and if we are giving an opportunity in the academics to take care about the learning and research with the other disciplines the faculty will be interested to do that and when they teach the other discipline their approach for the research as to understand and to apply those concept will also be better so this is an interdisciplinary approach fifth one is the culture of research as my chairperson also mentioned when we talk about and create an atmosphere for the research whether it is only for the sake of research or only to improve the number of publications or whether that research is depending upon the curiosity of that person or whether it uh, impact the society or or many so this culture of research which the university gives and create that awareness will also help the faculty to develop and also to attract and sometime of course outcome based the research is something that which we may have to do as far as the evaluation of the research is concerned sixth point is the high caliber talent so one is uh, what is that talent an university wants for the teaching for the research so that is also very important to define and then look for such kind of a people to attract and be with them infrastructure and facilities one is the campus life the other is inside the laboratory so what is that new equipment because many times my, when i talk to my faculty they say for some of the researchers equipments so they may have to go outside whether it is a laboratory central research laboratory or many others because of that there would be a delay or a lag in the research outcome if the university can produce over the years some of these important facilities interdisciplinary research uh, facilities center of excellence it would help to develop the uh, the world class faculty eighth one is the financial resources and the financial resources when i talk from and representing a private organization and private university most of the time the financial resources will come from an undergraduate student now this needs to be given for the proper compensation for the faculty and also to develop uh, the research facilities the model is slightly difficult because if i wanted to give a good compensation good research facilities facility i need to increase the fees and it will be a burden on the cost of education the alternative could be very difficult but very challenging but university must go that have the collaboration with the industries and get at least the research from the industries or tap the alumni resources because today happy to observe that the alumni are coming back and giving back to the institution especially on some specific activity and research is one of them ninth point is the commitment to the quality so the good faculty when we accept and recruit and retain them so they look for the quality quality does not mean only on on um, 
uh, what you say on the research quality is on the, on the academic delivery the quality is also on the operational issues and the transparencies and all the last point that i will say it is the importance of autonomy when you have the faculty members with the interdisciplinary high quality high talent every faculty wants some kind of autonomy in the an academic uh, or designing the course or delivery in the course or sometime the evaluation models too in my opinion my dear friends these are the 10 points i thought and if the university creates such kind of an atmosphere i think it will help to develop the 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 world class faculty to attract the one and also to retain with us so i'll stop it here i would be very happy to listen to the other uh, members and if any of these points maybe if there is a questions required i would be very happy to elaborate on that thank you very much sir thank you very much for the session and also keeping the time a very good afternoon to all of you i am much too delighted to be here and very much thank fiki for having me here and uh, the topic is very interesting because that's at the nerve center or of what we as academic institutions do because while running an academic institution there are things which you can buy and there are things that you have to organize things you can buy are infrastructure land buildings those kind of things and you it's all a function of money and how much you pour in and you get to see that but faculty is something which is uh, not something that you could actually end up buying and you can just uh, not wish that okay you put an advertisement tomorrow and there will be people who will apply and they would come so it is definitely the word developing is a very very important word and it's a word that uh, has to be in continuum and not like a one time or one shot affair as far as any education institution is concerned be it a university or be it a college or any such so uh, for the initial remarks i had actually made it into three parts one was uh, what are the student objectives that is what we intend to fulfill uh, second is how do we attract faculty and second thirdly it is how do we retain them and finally about some bit of performance management and what is performance management of a faculty and i'm much too glad that dr vargis actually gave me a data that he said uh, when he said only 11% of the people go to masters which means there is already a shortage and wherever there is a shortage you can very well understand to get people in an area where there is shortage is very very difficult and not only difficult it is it becomes an uphill task and as it seems it's already becoming a more uphill task and in that sense it is important that we have to have the right kind of mechanisms to attract good people so the first is uh, uh, first thing that i would like to talk about is how do you reframe the problem because if you look at the problem from its uh, usual way and then you use the usual methods then it's not going to work uh, you have to reframe the problem i remember good old days uh, when it was just about to bloom in india uh, and there were not enough computer engineering graduates today there is such a deluge that there is nobody else other than a computer engineering graduate that's a separate story but in those days the it companies started hiring the civil engineering graduates and why because civil engineering graduates were very well trained in the analytical skills as a part of the curriculum and the it industry realized that if they hire civil engineering graduates a they will attrition will be less because nobody will be going for them second you can train them well because they come with a lot of inherent skills of analytic analysis and mathematics which is very useful and that reframing of the problem helped them tide over the manpower crisis which was there at that time and of course they evolved uh, many many things over a period of time and perhaps similar things we need to do within the education domain where there is a shortage of good faculty we might have to reframe the problem that we have and then try and look at uh, various new means one of the things that i feel is uh, one we have to look at is while doing that what is the hiring pitch 
why should somebody come and join you? Because that one person who would be really good might have offers from 10 places. It could be the geography where you are uh, and those uh, uh, physical attributes, then salary and other things are all more or less the same. Then why should the person come to you and work with you, work for you? So there is a need of a hiring pitch. Uh, the pitch is very, very important that why should one come to you? And it should be followed by a personalized and a tailored experience because without that if you do it a one size fits all kind of an approach that's not going to serve. That might have worked in the past but may not work today. Okay. Then there is the retention. The retention part is about how do you retain them and it is much too important that you have to f uh, facilitate their career success in tandem with meaningful family life and address their personal health and well-being besides the other factors that one looks at. And third and the most important one is the performance management because how do you say somebody is world class, how do you say somebody is good and how do you then work with that that person to develop and uh, retain that person and that's where you need the performance as assessment matrices and without that it won't be possible for us to identify and then work with these people so that's the third point and thank you very much I guess I have finished it in time thank you very much waiting uh, on time you know may I request uh, professor uh, Sandeep Sanchetri Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Vicky, for this invitation. Thank you, Professor Varghese and others on the panel for setting the tone. The topic which we are discussing in this panel discussion is on developing world-class faculty. And I'd like to discuss this topic a little more philosophically than necessarily that what can be measured and what can be done. So the question comes, you want to develop something. When you want to develop, it's possible as long as you know the end result or the goal, which is what you should do when you want to develop something. But then the question comes, what is a world-class faculty? I tried to find the definition of a world-class faculty once I was invited to this panel and I didn't find an answer, let me tell you honestly. I'm very happy that preceding this session, we had a session on what you call world-class universities. And we are a subset of that, so I presume all the answers have been given in the master uh, session where the world-class university was already covered. But uh, I still would say that world-class faculty would be something very difficult to define. And even if you are able to define, I would possibly say that it will be difficult to measure and quantify, classify or whatever, doing thousands and thousands of faculty over a period of time won't be possible. And the whole process will be so dynamic that in this year, I can be very predictive. Productive and predictive maybe both. And you may give me a high level, but next year I may not do so. And once again, I'll have to. So uh, it's going to be difficult. Uh, my worry here when we are discussing this topic is why classes? Why not without a class? We have divided ourselves many times in classes and we have faced the music because of that. Since we don't have a very clear definition of world class, I would like to say that it should be having our own class. Today I may be a faculty who has to play multiple roles in my institution, including the leadership roles so starting from beginning. I might, by, might have been a blackboard teacher when I started my career. Things changed. I started doing research. I came into administration. I came into leadership. And every time my requirements are differing in terms of percentages and positioning of role play. If as a vice chancellor I am doing only my research and claiming that I published so many papers and patents, I think I will be highly unsuccessful as an academic leader as a vice chancellor. So we need to look at what we are trying to do. So I would uh, possibly uh, avoid calling someone as a someone as a world class faculty. That will be a misnomer for me. Pardon me if you are not agreeing but I will be open to uh, discuss this with you personally if you so like. For me a world class faculty will be a faculty who is well performing faculty. He or she decides what he wants to do or she wants to do. And to do so uh, 
we should have one fundamental change for faculty and that is India, in India particularly I'm saying in Indian context, we should have large number of faculty who are faculty members who are faculty by choice and not by chance. Unfortunately, the, the later part is very heavy in our context that people don't find good avenues, they try many and ultimately they say, Kuch nahi mila to, I thought I'll become a teacher or a faculty. I think that kind of a thing has been happening for ages now. Maybe the percentages are reducing because the teaching careers are also very attractive there is no doubt about it so let's have do our part entice the new young generation to become faculty and that's how we'll become world class in in case we want to call it world class so there should be faculty by choice and not by chance in my opinion also we should uh, uh, when I say entice we should enable their entry into teaching profession expose them to worldly establishments people like us took 15 20 years before we knew what is our potential and what we can do. We were just confined to the four walls of that particular department or classroom or whatever it was and we didn't see the world and therefore we didn't have that self-belief and therefore we didn't, we were not predict, uh, uh, productive when we were supposed to be productive and having more time and more energy and therefore help them develop self-belief. I may keep changing my directions, may change my speed, may change my gears if it is an equivalent to a vehicle uh, but I should be knowing what I am doing and why I am doing and therefore you need to empower them. Once you have empowered them, they are able to take their decisions, obviously they will be, okay I am getting a signal here and uh, so anyway I will discuss some of, some of the points which are there, uh, which are very important when it comes to this but let's, remain, uh, let's uh, remember one thing that there is a multiplicity of roles of a faculty. If you are an academic, possibly you will have to do a lot of new things in terms of blended teaching learning, whether you are capable or not, we will have to think about it. We also have to think about are we a self learner when I am an academic? If I am not learning, how can I teach well because things are changing. So in an academic world, if I am confining to that, I should be doing something more. If I am doing research, possibly consulting, testing, innovation, entrepreneurship and so on and so forth can happen. If I am doing acad administrative roles as a teacher, as a faculty, possibly counseling, mentoring, team building, leadership, all those things will be important. So which attribute will make you what you call world class, we'll have to define. I like to keep it very flexible and these are my initial comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It is very difficult even after the session that we can define world class, what it means in a precise terms. So thank you very much for highlighting that. May I request Professor Wang? Also, uh, dear panelists, and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to be invited by the FIGI to attend this uh, fabulous uh, panel. And uh, I'm the only non Indian in the panel, but don't worry, this is my 46th visit to India. I have so many Indian friends, uh, you know, so also uh, I have established 10 Taiwan education centers in India to offer Mandarin Chinese courses to Indian students. I have trained more than 14,000 students, including 48 military officers. So this is my great pleasure to be in India again. This is my second visit to India this year, right after the COVID-19. And we, I would like to share our, point, uh, our viewpoints regarding the world-class faculty from my university. Ever since uh, every new faculty uh, uh, participate in our university, we start with education, educating, because not every professor know how to teach well. So we provide orientation for every each new faculty to let them know how to teach well, how to use the modern technology to teach, okay? Especially during the COVID-19 period, we teach them how to use the modern technology to offer online courses. I think it's critical. Even this uh, support from the university lasts for professors who want to get promotion. No, not every professor know how to do research well. So we provide mentorship from senior professor to younger professor to let them know how to do better, how to do research better. I think this is a very key point because professor play a key role in university. 
I still remember when I was undergraduate student, I learned so much from my professor, not only the knowledge, but also the characters, also our professor teach us how to face the war, how to behave yourself well. I think those are things our professor must teach the student. Secondly, we need to provide many options for our faculty members. For example, some professors are only good on publishing journal papers. They don't care about uh, the application of their theory. They just publish papers. But some professors, they are both on good on academic work, but also know how to have a good business. So in our university, we have established Center for Innovation also for incubation. So for those professors, not only want to have good performance in academics, he or she could have opportunity to develop, to have a new company inside the university. We incubate the company for three years, up to three years. They, then they can go out of the university to establish a new company. It has been so successful because our university is only 10 minutes from the world famous Science Based Park. We have strong connection with all high tech companies there, including TSMC, so that all professors have the best opportunity to implement what they learn, also what they, uh, what the research are to transfer to the uh, industry. It has been very successful. I think this is a very, very good thing for professors, not only to teaching research, but also transferring technology. Last point, because of time limitation, our university has been very active in globalization. One of the most successful examples I would like to share with you is a dual PhD degree program. We have had uh, collaboration with University of Liverpool UK for more than 10 years about dual PhD program. We already have 40 students graduated under this program. Another 40 students here in the program, we have received more than 150 proposals from professors on both sides. Each year, we have a bilateral workshop. Today's professors know each other, and then we evaluate the proposal, and we interview students, best students all over the world. Maybe after 20 interviews, we could accept only one student. Okay, so I think it's very important for our professors to go abroad, make friends in the whole world, and work together with professors in other parts of the world. So I think I'll stop here because of time limit. Thank you very much. Thank you to startups, which is also essential to understand the process of education. It's also online courses, and also, more importantly, the collaborations. But the one difficulty with Asian countries, including your country and all our countries, is that for collaborations, we look only westward. We do not look eastward. We do not look to our own regions, you know. That is one of the limitations of the collaborations, arrangements that you are making. Friends, uh, let, me, let me invite uh, Professor Sharma. Uh, one of the disadvantages of um, being the last one on such an illustrious panel is that I did prepare some points and unfortunately all those points have been covered by the previous speakers. So while, on the, while others were speaking, I was thinking that what could I add to this conversation while uh, others have already kind of uh, mentioned um, almost everything that I, I could add. Uh, so I thought maybe I'd add a couple of um, things from the practical, practical aspects. Um, I work with UPS Dehradun. Uh, and I joined the institution about three years back and we are trying to do several interesting things which, which could eventually I hope we would be able to present as a case study in, in some point of time uh, including hiring 350 faculty members over the last two and a half years from all over the world uh, any good institution that we can think of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley National University of Singapore and so on uh, and including of course top Indian institutions and so on so there is some uh, kind of reflection as to what made us attract those faculty members um, uh, and therefore kind of vaguely getting into this developing world-class faculty terrain. Also secondly, um, the thing was um, uh, 
I mean, generally world class faculty and developing them would have two things. One is raw material, of course, which Professor Sancheti mentioned and so on. The second is that as part of the process of continuation, how do we develop them and kind of retain them and so on? Uh, how do you incentivize them, reward them, encourage them and so on? So I think one of the key things uh, which is coming out and Professor Sancheti did mention that, you know, it's by choice versus chance and so on. Um, so one is that academia is under direct competition, especially in uh, many, many areas directly with industry. And therefore, the ability to attract and retain talent is limited, uh, particularly uh, as a private institution, I can say that the demand is more into the areas, for example, computer science and so on, whereas the supply on the faculty side is quite limited. And the ability uh, to attract and retain top quality talent, which possibly we would hopefully want a talent which is also uh, sought after by Google and Microsoft of the world, but maybe we may not even be able to pay to one tenth of what they generally pay. So, so what's the, where does this money come from? What are the other things that we could do and so on? And also, while talking to, so I, I was involved almost in every, each and every interview of these 350 faculty members. And one of the key things that I noticed was that most of the faculty members that we hired belonged to millennials and Gen Z kind of uh, population. And one of the things that um, was coming out was that they were not, most of them, but not looking to join conventional government universities. Uh, and one of the key things was also that they were not happy with the hierarchical structures and, uh, you know, legacies and sirs and mems of the cultures of the world and so on. And they wanted a more like a startup-like environment wherein they can flourish, their ideas are appreciated, they get freedom to work, create difference uh, and what not. They're generally full of energy, young people, they want to create a difference not just to their students' lives, but to the society, solve problems and so on. So how do we create that ecosystem within the universities and make them start up like uh, is one of the questions which we are trying to work upon. Uh, I mean, including organizationally, how do you structure them and so on. So we felt that we would do it more problem-centric rather than department-centric. So one of the things that we did was we dissolved all the departments at the university and we kind of created uh, problem-specific clusters. For example, um, uh, sustainability, for example, is one area of cluster. Energy is another cluster and so on. People from different disciplines come and become part of these clusters rather than historic departments such as civil engineering and mechanical engineering and so on. And therefore, they get to interact with people from different backgrounds, whether it is psychology, engineering, economics and so on. So, so that's one uh, small little thing that we try to do. Also, I think uh, one of the practical issues, um, public institutions of course are cushioned or they were cushioned at least by government support and so on, but private institutions, the challenge is that where do you get money from? Um, you know, uh, Professor mentioned about, um, uh, you know, the fee implications. Uh, on top of the envelope calculation is that uh, generally speaking if we target a 15 is to 1 student to faculty ratio, which is the norm by NIRF NAC and I mean of course global standards would be like 8 is to 1 is to 10 is to 1 kind of a ratio. Essentially, um, even if I take a conservative estimate, seventh pay commission, the on an average CTC of a faculty member would come out to be about 15 lakhs a year a junior faculty member. Essential, and then again if we benchmark, generally the cost of salaries would not be one third than the overall revenues of the university and which essentially would mean that from these set of 15 students the university has to get and if you have to pay a CTC of 15 lakhs you have to collect a minimum fee of 45 lakhs from these 15 students bringing it to 3 lakhs rupees of fee per student per year that's the minimum. And essentially, um, if, you, if you look at the fee structure at most private institutions in India, it's significantly lower. And which essentially brings down the, uh, the value that they can provide to faculty members. And on an average, they end up paying 6 to 8 lakhs rupees of CTCs to faculty members. And at that CTC, if you expect to get world-class faculty members, 
the floor is open for debate um, and therefore we thought that and and there is no end to this tragedy i mean how do we get additional revenues there is no research funding in india the way uh, it's available at several developed countries and so on so then after a lot of deliberation we resorted to startups so we felt that every year we would incubate 200 startups such that in next 5 years we incubate and graduate 1000 startups and in out of these 1000 startups hopefully at least one third of them would have faculty members as co-founders equity holders and so on and the university also would take by way of incubation about 2% equity in every startup by way of success rate and randomness hopefully 2 to 3% of these startups would succeed and eventually hopefully generate a huge endowment for the university and also a lot of wealth for these faculty members who are equity holders and co-founders with these startups initial results are promising i would say uh, we currently have about 100 startups this is what we started as part of our first cohort of which about 10 to 20 have faculty co-founders and so on so which is one of the interesting experiments which is helping us to attract some of the faculty members which we otherwise would not have been able to attract and so on uh i think the last question uh, which i would um, raise and then kind of rest my case is there are of course several um, models uh, korea national uh, singapore um, even saudi arabia lately has um, started to attract a lot of uh, high quality faculty members and so on but again i mean everything has a cost and where do the, where do we get these additional resources and money from is um, i think um, uh, a question that i'm happy to discuss and deliberate as part of the q&a thank you so much much for bringing another dimension which is about the salary it's also it's not an automatic thing that you know if the salaries are going up the quality is going up you know in india if you see that teacher salaries have gone up substantially if you see from the 19 beginning of 1980s onwards but i don't think that that has reflected in terms of the quality of higher education in india while it is important to attract as i mentioned one of the basic problems that higher education faces is that we are succeeding to attract mostly the second rates so our capacity to improve their quality and produce world class teachers is also limited by the structure from which we are recruiting the faculty members friends uh, we have some time 15 minutes with us to have uh, some discussions question answers etc my request to you to please in identify yourselves and try to be brief so that we can have more number of questions at least to four, four or five and what i'll try to do is that i'll collect two or three questions first then i give to the panelist and if the question is addressed to any particular panelist please address that otherwise i'll generally give to all the panelist thank you yes yes please you please stand up and identify yourselves I'm from Project Guru, and my question is for uh, uh, panel members, Mr. Prabhu and Mr. Deshpande and Mr. Sancheti. Uh, one issue that has been brought repeatedly is that of budgeting, financial constraints for faculty members. But isn't it true that faculty members are looking for support in other aspects also? Like they do not want to take up non-teaching related uh, tasks like administration handling and creation of content and uh, and anything that is not core research or teaching related. Don't you think that reducing burden in that way would help bring us more faculty into you know brighter faculty and uh, more contribution in core uh, function that is teaching and research? Okay, thank you. I will. I'll uh, come back to you. Anybody else would like? To? Yes, please. Yes, can you give the microphone to? You are quite far away. Even if you are louder, we may not hear it. Thank you. My name is Rajesh. I, I am a co-founder and CEO of Calvium. 
Uh, we, uh, I heard all the panelists talk about the input quality is also of critical importance, totally uh, on that point. Uh, what I would like to understand the views around uh, how would we alter or change the uh, qualifying criteria for becoming a faculty itself. Today from whatever we understand, majority of them uh, who would like to teach may not have the requisite qualification, they may have experience. I, I understand this whole professor of practice uh, coming into play, 15, 20 years of experience and so on and so forth. Can there be a via uh, where we have younger people who will have an interest and passion towards teaching itself but may not have a master's or a PhD qualification but they have the requisite experience. I understand this will require a lot of uh, deliberation in terms of full-fledged framework and all but directionally do you see that could potentially solve our uh, input quality uh, criteria? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Prabhur. I'm a student from Symbiosis. Um, the first thing that I want to ask is that when we talk about the retaining or creating a world uh, level faculty, the best thing is that from my generation we are not pushed or we are not incentivized to take up teaching as a profession. Rather we are incentivized to go into the industry as you suggested that there's a com competition between the two. Now wouldn't it be better if during our set students we should be incentivized or given process Aspects as to how to enter into the teaching faculty and how to develop a relationship with them because as of right now uh, most universities do not offer such kind of a incentive towards the students and should that be developed by ourselves itself or not okay thank you very much one more last please I am happy that at least there is a woman representation in the questions oh, oh sorry I, madam I will come back to you because he, is, uh, he has already started I'll come back to you. I'll take the fifth question. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Please go ahead. I am Dr. K. G. Mehta from Mesana, Gujarat. Sir, my question is: How much minimum expense should be carried out? for the faculty salary. Uh, I think this criteria varies from certain agencies to agencies. Uh, if we uh, provide good salaries to the faculty, I think uh, minimum percentage, 50% of the revenue of the um, uh, total generation of the fees should be in the fees, should be provided for the salary of the faculties. Thank you. That is too less, sir. In many places, you know, 50% of the fees is too less salary. <laughs> okay, yes, madam, it's your turn. And uh, this will be, you'll have the last word on this. Uh, no, but there may be recording, so it is better. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Snehal, and I'm the CEO and founder of Skillspansia Learning Solutions based out of Nagpur. So my question uh, is uh, for Dr. Ram Sharma. So I love the calculation, pretty crisp, precise, and to the point, nailed it with the budgets. Now, uh, the concern is that you rightly said a lot of uh, faculties become faculties not by choice, but uh, by chance. And there are a lot of faculties who are senior faculties today and a lot of universities are dependent on them because of course they have knowledge. But there are certain barriers like the ego clashes wherein they are not ready to change their style of dealing with students just like millennials and Gen Zs do. They are not ready to uh, you know, negotiate with the new trends that are coming in which may be liked by the students eventually. It's a student teacher relationship. So how do we deal with it? What could be the pathway? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Friends, I will give uh, two minutes maximum. You can be less than that to each of the panelists. You can choose uh, the questions that you would like to say. Because, you know, say for example, the questions about non-financial responsibilities to be taken up, it was given for three of you together. And that I, I am not uh, separating that you should speak only on that. I will suggest that you make some general comments based on the questions that came up. Yes, can I start with the Professor Wang? Okay. 
I think uh, India and Taiwan also face a similar problem. Now the, our younger, uh, young generation, they want to get a job in the science-based park. The salary has more attractive than to be a professor. So we have to, you know, uh, we got some money from industry. We set up a foundation to provide additional salary for our young generation so that we have been successful to recruit very good professors. Also for senior professors, university does have a mechanism to let our senior professors to find collaboration with industry. In Taiwan, uh, if you have a project with industry, you could obtain additional salary. But that's not the only thing we could keep the professor. You know, because industry provide very, very attractive pro uh, salary to our senior professor too. So that, like I say, we should have choice for our professor if they want to start a company or work with students to have a company, we should encourage them to do. But I would say, please let the senior professor stay in the university to direct students, not to them, to, not to let themselves to be the manager of the company then it's uh, not valuable because professor has more knowledge than the students because after many years of accumulation of our experience, we should stay in university to guide our students to run the company and provide further guidance and provide further research outcome to help them to grow. If you yourself duck into the, get into the, the, the company, you, you may not be to do more, any research then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So first of all, the clarification, I did not uh, mean to say that um, uh, faculty CTC is proportional to faculty quality. That is not what I meant. What I meant was that what is the bare minimum uh, as per the current norms um, from, let's say, if we benchmark with public institutions, if a private institution has to match the bare minimum salaries similar to public institution, then what would be an average cost for a private institution is what I meant. Uh, I think uh, the, the question that was specifically asked to me was um, about, um, you know, the attitude of the faculty and so on. So I mentioned about the same thing. It's not just about attitude of faculty versus student. It is also the relationship of the senior faculty versus junior faculty because the junior faculty members who are coming, they are also millennials and Gen Z. They don't want to be treated in a way that their seniors treat them. I mean, um, I am senior, I am higher, I mean, I am, I am professor or I am dean or I am head of department and so and so and therefore you must listen to me uh, is not the way I think the, um, uh, the top faculty would stay with you. And the same principle applies to a classroom also. I mean, one of the experiential thing that we are observing is that students don't generally like to come to classes these days unless the faculty is really exciting them uh, and it's kind of a process of co-learning rather than unilateral, uh, you know, from higher pedestal that I am PhD and I am, uh, I know more than you and therefore you must listen to me. So it's like, so again, as I said, it is inter-faculty as well as between faculty and students uh, and it, it does not necessarily apply only to the classroom. It, it's the entire university culture uh, through which this entire relationship piece is um, um, weaved together uh, is what I think um, matters. Thank you. Uh, the question uh, which was raised is uh, if a faculty member who is involved in other works, administrative or others. Uh, it's a good thing. Many universities have started uh, looking from that angle. As uh, Professor Sharmaji also mentioned, if there is a possibility that he can also be a co-inventor, he can also start patenting it and uh, have the, uh, what is the return from that. So that is the one part of it. The another, a large number of universities today are also having an online education. For an online education, the content need to be created, curated and presented in different way. And this requires uh, an additional skills. The idea is that a few universities are promoting some of the internal faculty members to create the content for that. The idea is tomorrow even for the same kind of a skills can also be used back for the campus based program because the PPT dates are gone, PowerPoints are become powerless. 
so that is the reason the few universities are also doing it just like a corporate again then another group of universities are also going on the a thorough performance based management system over which their performance are being measured the another concept which also came which is called as a nine box where there is not only the performance and understand the potential of that and then create an additional kind of a revenue to be given so all different models are started working and if it start giving the the grade wise salary just like the earlier government structure then it will be burden on the student uh, uh, fees and uh, as my chairman already told increasing the salary will in never increase the, or no guarantee of increasing the quality of the faculty university has have trying and a few of the models are very successful but few of the models are experimenting we have to yet to wait and watch for it thank you sir as couple of points uh, one is on the uh, uh, faculty and the remuneration i think uh, higher education especially since it's not recognized as a economic sector one of the factors that escapes the public policy is that one we are one of the largest employers of qualified manpower and uh, in that context if we look at and compare the salaries i think higher education sector today is better player better payer than many of the industries so that's something that should sink in because we are used to hearing that higher education doesn't pay well and industries pay well now uh, that is not a norm anymore it might be it, it it case to case it might change so that's something which is very important and we should understand biggest employer second is that we are paying at par with anyone and i mean everyone in our sector not us or anybody in particular second is as a role of the faculty there are three things that we regard that are critical that is teaching research and third is the service to the university or enterprise now this is the third factor which many a times people think that it's a burden but it's not a burden it it's your participation in the university community and for wealth creation and that cannot be uh, complement uh, that cannot be compromised in any way that oh i am just teaching and then i won't be able to do other thing because that is equally a part and parcel of what a faculty is expected to do thank you no not not the last word a general word i would say uh, i think there were many many good questions uh, combined answer for that would be uh, teaching profession of course is a noble profession for ages and let's understand it in the light of the autonomy which we enjoy or can enjoy also the longevity this profession has compared to many other professions so we should not compare what is my starting salary or end salary and all that however if i want to give you an example of uh, the salary part because this was uh, there were a lot of questions on that 10 years 12 years back a delegation from india went to us and i was part of that and we prepared that what should we sell there and we found and it was from iic iits various other institutions we found the indian starting salaries for faculty team members in relative terms if you apply purchase power parity were higher than the us startup salaries so let's see it in light of that that uh, we should not see absolute thing or whatever in the context of india we were doing very well and on top of that the longe longevity and the autonomy why i'm saying autonomy is i can do my startups i can write books i can possibly have patents i can do the transfer of technology i can do consulting uh, consultancy and testing and i can earn more money if i'm so desperate for the money part of it so there are avenues for that and the last answer i'd like to give how to make it world class please for god's sake let's not restrict ourselves to what you call the regular faculty uh, that norm has to go from our mind including our regulators the, the faculty could be industry faculty professor of practice it can be joint appointment of faculty between industry and us it can be emeritus professor and honorary professor visiting professor and expert or adjunct professor so many avenues are there and there 
concepts. Therefore, let's explore them. Let's not discard them that they are not counted as faculty. I think they have worldly experience. And the last answer for catching the people young and enticing them and making them by choice, please refer to a report submitted by Kakotkarji in 2013, Kakotkar Committee report. He reviewed, by the way, IITs and NITs all put together in two different parts. And a scheme was made where any top institutions, private or government, top 10% or 20% students would be enticed and there was a model that they can do their masters, PhD while they take the track of faculty. So such models are there. Only thing is we need to promote them, talk more about them and implement them more seriously. We'll be successful in getting world class faculty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is really an interesting viewpoint from different uh, panelists that you have heard. But uh, essentially, we don't have world class universities in India and we do not have world class teachers also. These two are linked. So our effort should be not only to bring a bright young mind to the teaching profession, but also give them opportunities to develop and grow intellectually. You know, that is the challenge that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for our eminent panel here on the stage. As I request, uh, gentlemen, for a group photograph. Thank you. Before we break, take a break from here, we would like to remind each one of you about the feedback forms that have been distributed to you. We would request you to kindly spare a few moments during the rest of the day and fill in the feedback forms and hand over either to our support staff inside the hall or you may hand them over at the registration counter outside. So ladies and gentlemen, we now break for lunch. And the next session will commence at 2.15 p.m., requesting everybody to be seated five minutes before that. And lunch is served in the food hangar right across the exhibition area. It's been properly marked. You can't miss it. So please enjoy your lunch and be back in time for the next session and be seated five minutes before 2.15. Thank you. And please do not forget about the feedback form. Feedback from you is very important for us in improving our performances in the upcoming events. Thank you very much, Dean. GR, Vice President, Oberoi Global, and Dean, Middle East College. Warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Dr. Left General Rajan S. Garewal, Vice Chancellor, Sikkim Manipal University. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Dr. Nandita Abraham, Chief Partnership Officer, Global University Systems, GUS India. Warm welcome to you. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Vidya Yeravdekar, Chair Fiki Higher Education Committee, will be joining us shortly on the panel. She would be welcoming Mr. Amitabh Kant here on the stage. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, a warm welcome to the session, the panel discussion session on exploring new frontiers of partnerships and networks. And the time duration for the session is approximately one hour. That is 60 minutes, which includes the opening and closing remarks by our distinguished moderator and deliberations, addresses, or presentations by all our eminent speakers, followed by question and answers in the end, if the time permits. And with those words of introduction of the session, I hand over to Dr. Rajni Gupte, the Vice Chancellor, Symbiosis International University, our distinguished moderator, for your opening remarks, ma'am, and to kindly carry forward the proceedings. Good afternoon. So as we enter into this sixth session of the conference, I think this morning we've been speaking about world-class universities, world-class faculty, and I think uh, there were many allusions to, many people alluded to uh, how we can have, how can we reach there? How do we get to this target of world-class universities? And one way that was pointed out was as a logical conclusion was of course, uh, how do we collaborate? How do we uh, build partnerships? And how do we leverage networks? So uh, I think it's all of us realize that partnerships and collaborations uh, really are the way forward. But in practice, I mean, I, that's the theory which all of us know. But in practice, especially if we, are, if we talk about closer home, 
we realized that not too many people uh, find partnerships so easy. There's, there, there are apprehensions about collaborations. People feel that it's difficult to col collaborate with competitors. Right? I think especially if you're from the same city, the same town, the same state, the same country. In fact, this was mentioned this morning that uh, maybe partnerships across the uh, frontiers, across the across countries are, are simpler than partnership from Yale. Uh, who strikingly shared that uh, even in business, it makes a great deal of sense to collaborate, for competitors to collaborate. And this really is usually done to lower the cost, to share the costs of uh, extremely high costs of development, especially if it comes to software or hardware, or also uh, possibly to make sure that your competitors, other competitors, uh, realize that you are serious about your game. A couple of examples that come to my mind uh, where competition and collaboration or competition and cooperation coexisted uh, could be the story of Apple and Amazon. You know when uh, the, um, they teamed up to distribute Amazon eBooks on Kindle. Now this was, these were competitors who were trying to make good on their, competition, uh, their competitive strengths and yet cooperating to make sure that the market share increased. I'm sure all of us are aware of the recent, uh, the 2020 example of Pfizer and BioNTech, um, where for the COVID vaccine, the development as well as the manufacturing of the vaccine was again a collaborative ex uh, exercise between competitors. So this, uh, these are, and there are many, many examples, especially in the automotive industry or in uh, the hardware and software industry. Several examples which show that competitors in business do collaborate. And this is done to share costs or to leverage competitive strengths or comparative strengths. So obviously, uh, this is a model that is there. And I feel very strongly that while uh, there would be collaboration, if it, if it can happen in business, where the sole objective is profit, I do think that if it's an education institution that we are talking about, which is a noble profession, we are trying to create the man uh, workforce for the future, where we are really looking at creating people. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I do think that we need to go beyond looking at fearing competition. I think it's important for us to understand that collaboration and networking is the way ahead, whether it be nationally or internationally. I don't think there's any uh, reason for anyone to feel that uh, I cannot share my my secrets with someone else. I think each institution has its distinctive features which it can leverage upon and that really is the secret, uh, the secret of going forward. So while we talk about all of this, I'm going to, my esteemed panel over here is going to be sharing their experiences. I have a wonderful set of people over here and they come from across the globe. Uh, Professor Agnes, uh, who's a Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement from the University of Brazil, Bristol. Uh, Dr. Bridget Freeman. A senior researcher from Australia, University of Melbourne. Dr. Kiran, the Vice, Vice President, Obrial Global and the Dean of Middle East College. So I have, we have international representation. We also have uh, Dr. Greval, the Vice Chancellor of Sikkim Manipal University and Dr. Nandita Abraham, the Chief uh, Partnership Officer, Global University Systems, GUS India. So with, I'm sure all of you are eager. Uh, I'm sh it's the post-lunch session, but I'm sure we're going to keep you riveted. So over to my esteemed panel. Uh, I'm sh I think we can start with Agnes, right? 